I'd like to have an X-ray machine for people. The answer to that is self-evident. You know, I'd like to have a. I'd like to have an X-ray machine for people's hidden sex lives. Uh, no, no, thanks. If we knew what, if we could tell, we're rolling. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we're talking about Sally Hemings because we've been on a second of two of three programs about Jefferson in France, and inevitably, no matter how you try to handle Jefferson's time in France, you do come up against Sally and James Hemings, and so we tried to give it the least amount of treatment that it can hold. Oh, I think it was a. It's you know, it's as a fair. way of taking it's, over. It's, well, it's part of the story of Jefferson in France. By the way, welcome to this podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Here's my philosophy. I'll tell you in a nutshell. Good. It wouldn't surprise me if it's true. Right. It doesn't seem to me to be out of character necessarily. It wouldn't surprise me if it's not true. I repeat, it wouldn't surprise me if it's not true. If it's true, we don't know quite what it means. It was a 30-some year relationship, if it's true. And we have to try to decide how to figure out what that must have meant. Some people think that would inevitably be rape. Other people believe, no, it could have been a star-crossed love affair. We can't know. Neither one of them left records about this. It's all speculation. And it's taken over too much of the discourse. That's the fact. The real issue is Jefferson and slavery. I repeat, the real issue is Jefferson and slavery. The jefferson Sally Hemings story is prurient. It's the, the National Enquirer. And you, David Swenson, are quite right when you say – in spite of the fact that the circumstantial evidence doesn't look good, and in spite of the fact that the DNA at least accuses or convicts a Jefferson, not necessarily this Jefferson, of being the father of at least one of Sally Hemings' children, nevertheless, there has been a rush to accept this as truth without any shred of skepticism left by people who should know better, that that we don't know enough yet to conclude 100 percent that Jefferson was the father of those Sally Hemings' children. And let's not spend all their time. But, you know, you have to accept then the fact that this guy who was pretty advanced in age, a president who had been accused of this stuff during the campaign, made a trip home and fathered another child. Well, that leads to my final conclusion. You know what's coming. It's Jenkinson's Law. Below the belt, all bets are off. Yeah, yeah. Below the belt, it's true. All bets are off. We don't know the secret lives of people because they don't talk about them, David. And there is an anarchy. You know, Washington wrote a famous letter to his niece, and he said, there's something combustible in the human spirit. Okay, so we're talking um, now about this because we're doing the podcast intro, and we just finished the podcast, and and that's where we ended up. uh, But mostly the show is about Jefferson and his duties in, in France. France. But right. you know why we're talking about it is because it bothers me. It bothers me too. When we get into the Sally Hemings zone, I always feel that no matter how disciplined we are, we give it more attention than it can really hold. And I resent that this story has become so central in any examination of Jefferson's life. I, I subscribe, as you know, to the whole man theory. Yep. And people are entitled to a very large range of privacy about such things. And for us to spend as much time mucking around is really a mistake. You know, it's – I mean, friends of mine who even know I'm involved in the show will say, well, fuck, he's, he's, a, well, a, he's a rapist. He, you know, he's a child and – Remember, William Clark married a 15-year-old when he came back from his so journey. I mean, it, it was not unusual for them to be sexually active at that. I was sexually active by the time I was 30. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. All right, so <laughs> Jefferson in France, part two. Program 112, which is about Jefferson and his diplomatic portfolio in France, his trip to England, his trip to the wine districts of southern France. Pretty interesting stuff that, you know, he was basically a failed diplomat, but— Yeah, but that wasn't entirely his fault. Not his his fault at all. You know, we we talked about that, about how he—his breakthrough with uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia and— I mean, I, I look at it and kind of read some of the peripheral stuff about the time and how little people, what little regard people held the United States in. And I'm kind of going, geez, you got that done. I'm trying to figure out the analogy, David, but it'd be like Albania coming to Washington, D.C. and wanting to be taken seriously. And you, of course you do, but it's Albania. It's not a major nation. It's not France. It's not Germany. It's not England. It's not Spain. It's not Russia. It's Albania. And so that's how Europe felt about the United States. It's like, okay, we well, get I it. Well, even worse than that because we'd just been through a war and they didn't, you know, they, they got enough news to know that there were all these knuckleheads fighting in Congress back then. They wouldn't, they wouldn't agree to anything. The states were going to fall no apart. There was no centralized power. 
Um, we weren't know, paying our bills. That, and, and so, I mean... So this is that... Is that this, are these guys a good bet? Probably not. And yet here's this, this elegant, tall... Virginian is a little bit famous for a couple of the things he's written. He, he had to be able that, just his status and being a friend of Franklin. It had to open doors. It, for it him. had to, but then, then you think, well, what's going to come out of his mouth? And then it's this incredibly idealistic, even utopian model treaty that war will be only between combatants on certain seasons and so on. Prisoners will be freely exchanged. There will be no torture. Uh, no farmer will ever have to fight. No ship will ever be molested. When, when the Europeans read this, they thought, what world do you guys live in? And I mean, then we go into him and the French Revolution, and boy, that's where he really kind of— That's where he becomes so— That haunted him forever. Well, you know, we didn't talk about this, but but Connor Cruz O'Brien, in his book, The Long Affair, Jefferson and the French Revolution, shows, and I think conclusively, that late in his life, Jefferson went back over his correspondence from that period and touched it up a little. And so instead of saying this will certainly end in the establishment of a free— You think that's true? Yes. That he knew that he had been exposed as a ninny. Well, you could understand that, I guess. And that he just slightly, instead of saying it is certain that this will end happily, he says it it may well end happily. He changes things that you can change in the margins of a letter because he felt that that he had been a little bit naive, I think, uh, by the— the way the French Revolution f- dissolved into chaos and madness. And I have a to reign say, I, I really enjoyed these past two discussions with you. I always learned so much from you, and it's, uh, it's, I'm enjoying it's, this. Like, me too. Here's why, David: is is that you know, week after week, we talk about this or that subject. This is a chance to step back and re- and try to rethink Jefferson and to put him to use the accumulated life experience and the thousands of shows that we've done and the reading that we do and so on to to bear on him and to try to create a new synthetic or fresh, let's put it, synthetic view of him. I just love it. I hope our listeners do too, but I just love the fact that we're going systematically through Jefferson's life. We're now at 12. It'll probably take us up to 20, maybe 25 before we're, <laughs> we're be done next with this year, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's always, for me, there's always something new to learn and, and, and new ways to digest it and think about it. And so let's so, get out of the way and let people listen to this good. special out-of-character edition, Jefferson 112, Jefferson the Diplomat in France, 1784 to 1789. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, brought to you by Bismarck State College on the banks of the Missouri River at the heart of the Lewis and Clark Trail. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. The Thomas Jefferson Hour was created by the gentleman seated across from me now, the award-winning humanity scholar and author, Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and Clay, we're back to uh, continue our Jefferson 101 series. I think we're up to, this is Jefferson 112, and we agreed last week at the end of the conversation to come back to talk more about Thomas Jefferson's time in Paris, and I'm so pleased to continue this conversation. So welcome to you, sir. Thank you. So we're up to 112. 12 in Jefferson 101, and we're now in 1785 or so. He was born in 1743. So he's 40 years old. Right. We just touched on 1785 at the end of the program. And so he's he's lived about half of his life now. So we're probably going to have a 25-part series before <laughs> we finish Jefferson point, point 101. Well, we did decide uh, to spend more time this week talking about his job duties, his job description, uh, what, why he was there and, and what his official duties were. They had planned to send him over several previous times. He had always had reasons not to go. And one time when he was willing to go, uh, his diplomatic appointment was canceled because the the Treaty of Peace was signed. But now in 1784, Jefferson is 41 or 40 years old. He's grieving over the death of his wife, Martha. Uh, He has always wanted to get to Europe to do the grand tour, to see some of the great things about the old world, possibly all the way to Rome or Naples. And he gets this chance because Madison suggests to the Congress of the United States that they appoint Jefferson as as a minister plenipotentiary. So as a minister without 
portfolio, really, and Jefferson's duty would be to help create a model treaty between the United States and X, Prussia, uh, some German states, uh, France, uh, although we had an existing treaty with France, Spain, Portugal, the, the Barbary pirates. He was going to try to create a new set of diplomatic engagements with the countries of the old world so that we could improve our trade status and make, uh, make war less likely between the United States and the belligerents of Europe. Most of the people in Europe, uh, the political figures in Europe, they, they believed the United States wasn't going to make it. It was, just, it, was a, uh, it was going to fold. It wasn't going to survive. And so they had to have some – they had to do something to get countries to take them seriously. Yes, and, and Jefferson believed that a lot of the anti-American – press in Europe was being stirred up by England, who was still resentful of our independence. He exaggerated that, we now know. But from a European perspective, the United States was no more important than Guatemala or you know, no more important than Colombia or, or Nicaragua, just a little thing that's off the map of the known world. We've heard about it. They're, they're, they're experimenting with democracy. But they don't matter. And so Jefferson called his time as an American minister in France a school of humility. And it was a school of humility in two ways, David. First of all, um, he was no Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin was a world historical celebrity. Oh, share that quote with us, will you? Uh, so there's a, Jefferson liked to tell the story. But, but when he was actually appointed by the Congress of the United States to be the replacement for Franklin as the American ambassador. So he began as a minister plenipotentiary. Then in 1785, he's actually named America's ambassador to France. And he said, when my friends, my French friends always say, oh, Jefferson, so you replace Franklin, do you? He said, I always respond by saying, no, no one could replace him. I merely succeed him. Very Jeffersonian response. And it's true. Franklin was an international celebrity. Jefferson was not that well-known in Europe. But he, he, he became pretty well-known after being there for a while. And one way that he became well-known um, had something to do with his life back in Virginia. He had written something called the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, which disestablished the Church of England and the Anglican Church in Virginia and declared that the mind is utterly free and uncoercible and people would not be punished for um, worshiping in any manner that they chose, nor should they receive any civil rewards for it. And Jefferson was very proud of that bill, which was actually passed in 1786 while he was in Europe. It was Madison really who saw it through. Madison had the political uh, capacity, the, the strategic thinking and the stamina and the perseverance to see Jefferson's very idealistic bill through into law. And when Europe received copies of this, of course, Jefferson made sure that everybody received copies of this, um, he became justly famous because this was at the time in 1786, the most breathtaking law expressing freedom of conscience that had ever been uh, passed or contemplated in the history of the world. So suddenly Jefferson is famous for being a champion of religious liberty and freedom of the press. This was really a big moment for him, and it actually gave him more fame in European circles than his authorship of the Declaration of Independence, which was not widely known at the time. So Jefferson arrives in Paris, what is it, I want to say August 6, 1784. Right. He's come by boat from Boston. They left on July 5th on a boat that was on its maiden voyage. It's really just a yacht. They arrived in England, and then they made their way over to Le Havre. And then from Le Havre uh, to Paris, he arrives in Paris as what he calls a savage from the woods of America. And there in Paris as well, we have John Adams. And, and Dr. Franklin. So what a time it was. But within a year, he was there alone. Franklin goes back to the United States. Franklin had been ill. He, was, he had been really panting for retirement for a very long well, he was time. He 80 years old. Right? And he had the gout. And very poor health. He was carried around uh, Paris on a litter, on a sedan chair. And prisoners from the French jails and other servants were allowed to carry the great Franklin around <laughs> in this chair. He was essentially uh, housebound. And most of the diplomatic business went to his uh, place at Passy, which was uh, in what's now a suburb. 
of Paris, and he was this international celebrity. John Adams was not very well known either. He and Franklin could not get along. Adams always disliked Dr. Franklin, admitted his greatness, but really couldn't stand him and was backbiting and undermining and, and grumbling the whole time. But Adams was appointed to be the first American ambassador to England, to the court of St. James. So Another bit of a dicey appointment, right? Yeah. <laughs> Adams goes to London and Franklin goes home and Jefferson is left alone with the diplomatic portfolio in France and he becomes America's first bona fide ambassador to France. Um, got his credentials, made his way for an audience with the king, all the things that one has to do, and would go down to Fontainebleau and to Versailles you know, once a week or once a month in full diplomatic regalia and do essentially frivolous things, bow and scrape before the king and stand around with other diplomats and get nothing done. Meanwhile, whenever anyone would, would deign to talk to Jefferson, who was always was a very, very modest man, he would try to pass off this model treaty, uh, the treaty which meant fair trade between the two nations, effectively most favored nation trading status between the United States and other nations. At this time, most nations were mercantilists. They had very protective tariffs and were doing everything they could to protect their own economic advantage, but no sense truly of, of free trade. And so Jefferson was advocating free trade in a world that wasn't quite ready for it, and he uh, was trying to advocate uh, tighter rules of engagement for wars so that they would be very limited in their havoc outside of trained combatants. So this was his portfolio. And particularly, David, he was trying to get a better deal for Virginia with respect to tobacco. Our tobacco was not widely available in Europe. England controlled it as a monopoly. They charged uh, re-export fees and so on. And so Jefferson believed that if he could open the, the continental market to American tobacco, this would be a great boon for America and, of course, for Virginia and, of course, for himself. But he was also trying to get American whale oil um, accepted in the European markets, and that would be New England and uh, American um, rum and, and, and indigo and rice and other American products. He didn't have much success in this way. He found that Europe went, was pretty hidebound in its mercantilist uh, discriminatory trade uh, protocols, and he worked really as, as with as much discipline as Jefferson worked on anything, which was always an enormous amount of discipline, trying to crack open these European markets. He never really succeeded. So from the point of view of Congress, sending Jefferson as a commercial minister to Europe, uh, he essentially failed, and he knew that he had failed. But he had many other duties. He was up against a, a sort of a, a, a decentralized federal government, so he had even less negotiating, ne negotiating power. But um, I wanted to ask you, I read that like 85 percent of the goods that came into America came from Great Britain. Was that a noticeable amount of trade for for Great Britain or not? That was gigantic. And So, and, I mean, we, we had that power as as being one of the big customers. Well, we had it, but we also were utterly dependent upon Great Britain for our imports. So they, they were monopolizing our economy. And Jefferson wanted a declaration of economic independence. He wanted us to move away from that. And we weren't that far from being at war with them either. We so. very, a number of times during this period, we came close to war with Britain. And Jefferson realized that we had won the the military battle, and we had declared political independence, but we were economically still profoundly dependent on Britain, and Britain was discriminating against American economic enterprise, and that this was no way to establish the, the true independence, the complete independence of the United States. So he worked hard, but, but here's where Hamilton comes in. I was just going to say, yeah. Hamilton. I get it, yeah. Uh, is rising. And his view is, it's great. Britain's navy protects um, international trade. There are we're naturally friends with Britain anyway. But let's let bygones be bygones. Uh, there's no reason to to try to have an economic war with Britain. You're not going to win it. We are prospering. It may it may not be the full prosperity and, that we and want. And oh, by the way, if we have a stronger federal government, we'll be even in better shape. Right. right. So, so Hamilton is not a, not frightened by our dependence on England. Jefferson hates it. His view is, why declare independence if you're just going to be their economic vassal? And so he's he. This begins what will become the 
struggle between the Hamiltonians who are pro-England and the Jeffersonians that are anti-British and largely pro-French. And this, this struggle will go on now from 1785 until at least the election of 1800 when Jefferson becomes the third president of the United States. We'll be back in just a moment. You are listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation. Well, this week it's about President Thomas Jefferson. We're continuing the Thomas Jefferson Hour 101 series. And this week we're up to, I believe, number 112. We're talking about Jefferson's time in Paris. And uh, when we took our break, you were kind of going over how grim the situation was for Jefferson in trying to negotiate trade deals. Well, it would be as if you know, Guatemala were trying to get deals at the United Nations, and everybody had bigger fish to fry, bigger concerns. They looked down on this upstart nation. As you said, there was a widespread view that the system would simply collapse and we would be reabsorbed under British colonial rule. And so most of Europe was skeptical of the United States to the extent that they even were aware of the United States. In other words, it wasn't as if Jefferson represented this fledgling republic. For most of Europe, that was off the map of the known world, and they couldn't care less what was going on in North America. What's a good lawyer do? If he can't get the big prize, he goes for lesser prizes and tries to build a case, right? And he gets Prussia. So of all places, Prussia, the home of Prussian militarism, no Germany yet existed. There were just German states. But Prussia had had enlightened rulers, including Frederick the Great, and so Jefferson is able somehow to conclude a model treaty with all those provisions of free trade and most favored nation trading status and um, some really intelligent and enlightened terms for combatants and non-combatants. He gets Prussia to sign. It's his only great success as a diplomat. Prussia is a landlocked nation that doesn't trade with the United States. But, but, but it was a start. It's a start and it's a good start. And and I should also say that the other big diplomatic failure, and it's a huge one because it has implications for Jefferson's presidency and for us, is that he tried to get a, a treaty with the Tripolitan pirate states. Morocco, Algiers. Right. Um, Tripoli. Yep. And he and Adams worked hard at it. Adams had done the preliminary work, and they thought that the the diplomats from the— North African Islamic pirate states were going to sign a deal with them. Adams even, there's a famous and very funny letter by Adams of smoking the hookah with this diplomat from North Africa. And Jefferson comes to England particularly to see Adams. This is 1786. He comes to England uh, so that he and Adams can, can close the deal on this treaty with the pirate states and it falls apart. And that then led um, almost inexorably to the undeclared naval and marine war that Jefferson fought with the North African states uh, beginning in 1801 while serving as president. Yeah, he didn't forget, but... He this, was, never wanted to negotiate with terrorists. The sidebar of that is he went to England and and there's this famous trip between... Yeah, because the diplomatic activities failed. So there Nothing were, to do. There were two. The, the, let's the, go the, see the, the treaty with the pirates right? collapsed and, and Jefferson and Adams dutifully tried to get a trade treaty with England and England couldn't be bothered even to negotiate with them. And so... These trips were very difficult. Jefferson didn't want to just turn around. Today, he just got on a plane and go back to Paris. But back then, that was an ordeal. So he and Adams decided to make the most of it. And they had a 
a little month-long vacation in the home counties of England. They went to many of the of the great gardens of England, um, including to Blenheim, which um, was one of the most beautiful uh, estates in all of England. And Jefferson took along Waitley's um, book on gardens and made marginal notes and was just fascinated because Jefferson loved landscape gardening anyway, and he wanted to create better landscape gardening at Monticello when he got back. And he loved the idea of the of man's connection with nature creating order, but not too much order. And so he and Adams did that. Adams was a little bit bored with that. He said it's way too soon to be talking about landscape gardening in America, Mr. Jefferson. But they also <laughs> went to, to Stratford. Uh, and they visited Shakespeare's tomb and they, his boyhood home, and they even chipped a little piece of wood off the chair that Shakespeare is said to have sat in. This was something that was allowed to tourists at the time. And they went to several British Civil War sites. Anyway, they had a pretty good time. And uh, it was really the, maybe the most harmonious period in the friendship between John Abigail Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And then after that, they exchanged shopping lists for Paris and London and lots of slightly flirtatious correspondence between Jefferson and Abigail and so on and so forth. So that was a, a little bit of a side trip in 1786, but was made possible by the diplomatic failure of the Tripolitan pirates. Huh. Uh, and af- after this trip, um, you, you said that was one of the most uh, friendly times between Adams and Jefferson, but did things fell apart after that? Then with the coming of the French Revolution was so disrupting to the world. I mean, this it's hard to exaggerate what this meant, but Europe had been locked into this feudal system and aristocracy and class systems and the state churches and Europe was a was a mature society. So it was even beginning at that time, the the seeds of the French Revolution. Jefferson was there to witness the beginnings of the French Revolution, the um, the attack on the Bastille, uh, the bread riots, um, the, the attempt of the flight of the king and so on. And Jefferson was fascinated by this for several reasons. First of all, he got to be an observer of one of the world's most important historical events. If you If you made the top 20 historical events in Western civilization since the time of the founding of Rome, Inevitably, the French Revolution has to be a part of that, David, and and so Jefferson got to see it, and he was, as a sociologist, as a student of of human cultures, and a and a and a deep classicist, he was completely obsessed and fascinated with the coming of the French Revolution, and he hoped that it would lead to an American style free republic. He thought that this is going to be more difficult because there's a lot more entrenched. Um, corrupt culture in, in France than there could possibly be in a new nation like the United States. But he assumed that it would play itself out harmoniously and that this would be the birth of European republics and that France would be the first one that carried the flame from Philadelphia over to Paris and then it would go from Paris to Berlin and from Berlin to Madrid and from, you know, and so on. Eventually, even England would be um, enlightened and revolutionized by the little flame that that was lit in the United States on the 4th of July, 1776. So he took pride in it, and he became attached to the success of the French Revolution, and and maybe more than he should have been. And so he defended the reign of terror, and he defended the excesses and the riots and, and the upheavals of the French Revolution because he believed that it was a necessary period of chaos that would end in something infinitely superior, which, in fact, eventually it did. But everyone not around in his him, lifetime. not in his lifetime, and yeah. everyone around him was oh, the other Americans: John Adams, Hamilton, George Washington, Fisher Ames, Rufus King, Marshall, even Madison. Thought, why well, this Jefferson has kind of gone off the deep end here. He's defending indiscriminate terrorism against the aristocrats of. Paris. He he kind of suffered from bad timing too, and and the delay in correspondence added to it as well. If I recall, he was writing these supporting statements, and then several weeks later, the things got worse. Things, yeah, the king was killed. And well, he, Jefferson believed. First of all, Jefferson was right that this was these were the agonizing death throes of a corrupt medieval early modern world that had to be swept away. He was right. Uh, 
and that these were the agonizing birth pangs of the new world that had to replace it. And he knew that this was not going to be a simple transition. He wrote a famous letter to Lafayette, which I sometimes quote on the Jefferson Hour, in which he said, did you expect to be transported from despotism to utopia on a feather bed? In other words, this was the necessary anarchy, madness, violence, bloodshed, reprisal that that you have to expect when you move from an exceedingly corrupt culture that's fundamentally unjust to most of its citizens to something more enlightened. And so he's looking at it as if he's from standing on the surface of Jupiter, not on the streets of Paris. And most Americans thought, this is too high a price. Probably it's not going to work out anyway, but it's much too high a price to to kill 10, 15, 20,000 people to make this happen. Think about trying to uh, pitch that to the American public in modern times. I mean, it, um, it, it, some things would be different, but some things would not. But this this position that, that Jefferson took is, is my understanding. I mean, all of a sudden there were those against him and those with him, and uh, they, they were pretty well defined, which was sort of new. A handful it? with him and almost everyone against him and principally against him, John Adams. So Adams loves Jefferson. They are dear friends. They're two of the five who wrote the Declaration of Independence. They have exchanged visits. They have essentially lived together in some part, Jefferson helps to raise John Quincy Adams. Jefferson and Abigail Adams have a very successful, mildly flirtatious, but 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 um, but acceptable friendship. Adams thinks Jefferson is the other class act amongst intellectuals of the American Revolution. Jefferson thinks Adams is kind of a grumpy and, and irascible guy, but on the whole, he's a class act and someone that they he can talk about with with about Plato and about Montesquieu and about vineyards and painting and and so on. So there's a deep solidarity and friendship between these two families. And Jefferson has a special place in the Adams world. Abigail Adams says he's, quote, one of the choice ones of the earth. But the French Revolution comes along and Adams is kind of intrigued by it, but basically appalled by it. I think it's fascinating because it's an instance where Jefferson becomes the realist, and Adams is like, I don't want to face that. You Adams' know? view is it can't be worth it. He calls it a nightmare of atheism and madness and bloodshed. They had to know that this fight for, you know, that this famous uh, tree of liberty needs to be watered with the— Blood, blood. of patriots and tyrants. That's Jefferson, not Adams. Yeah, but but they, everybody had to know that was a fact. They yeah, just been through the Revolutionary War, and, and, and uh, so you, you could, uh, couldn't you argue the point that Jefferson was saying, hey, look, we know this is the way it's going to go. You might as well face up to it. And Adams going, well, yeah, my, my, but we don't want to talk about that. But, but Jefferson's problem was that he was so cheerful about it he seems to be a cheerleader. For it. Yeah, he says the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. That is its natural manure. He says, I like a little rebellion now and then. Point point made. And I so Adams is like, maybe it's inevitable. Maybe it. Maybe even you can say that it's good, but well, you let's don't not talk about it. Let's like not it. <laughs> let's not like be toasting it. Uh -huh. And 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 people see in Jefferson a streak of the true believer, the true radical. And he says in the famous letter to William Short, which he wrote from uh, the United States when he got back, but short his protege and secretary is still in Europe and is sending Jefferson gloomy reports of the reign of terror. And Jefferson wrote the most notorious of all the 26,000 letters that he ever wrote in which he says, I'm really upset by the kind of alarmed rhetoric of some of your recent letters and, and the way you're talking about this thing. He says, if there were one, and I'm quoting now, if there were one Adam and one Eve, alive in every nation and alive free, unquote, that would be better than all of the despotisms of history. Imagine this. I mean, he's, can, he, can he mean this, David? If there were one Adam and one Eve— Well, put that in contemporary terms in our presidential election. What would happen? If Donald Trump said, if we nuked the whole world and there were one man and one woman left— But they were free. And they were free. That would be better than this— this broken world that I'm inheriting. Yeah, maybe that's not a fair example. No, it is a fair example because we've seen like the Cold War films of the last man and the last woman. At first, they don't get along and eventually they repopulate the earth. <laughs> that's what Jefferson's talking about. Now, we know he's using this to rhetorical excess. We know that this is an argument not 
his actual hope for the world. But when Adams reads something like this, he thinks, I'm not sure this Jefferson is fundamentally reliable. There's, there's something wrong with Jefferson. There's a streak of incendiary, revolutionary, true belief in this guy. He's not really a gentleman, and, and, it, and he's not really trustworthy because he's so radical. He's either posturing or he means it. Frenchified. And, and right? if he's posturing, that's horrible. But if he means it, that's worse. But but under any circumstance, he's not one of us. He's not he, – there's, there's something that's whimsically wrong and violent and scary in Jefferson's position if he's in earnest about it. And so this begins – to drive the wedge between Jefferson and Adams, and it will it will widen, and it will widen, and then in 1800 it will break down, and the friendship will end over the election of Jefferson to the presidency. And by if if you had been a historian looking at this in in December of 1800, you would say this friendship is never coming back. The, 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 these two have broken fundamentally, and there cannot be a repair. And then. In a kind of a secular miracle, in 1812, uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush brings them back into correspondence. And they wind up dying as close friends on the same day. But my point is, what's the explanation for the breakdown of the Jefferson Adams friendship? It's Jefferson and the French Revolution. And, and a lot of this came back to haunt him later in his political career. People quoted career. this stuff. Yeah, um, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get to in a future show. We, we, we have, we've taken us, ourselves up to the uh, French Revolution, but there's some things that happened before that, um, particularly, and I want to hear from you about it, the, uh, the trip to southern France. So Jefferson, I have to just, I'll quickly introduce Maria Cosway and then we can come back. But sure. Jefferson is a widower. He thinks that his romantic and sexual life is over, that he's just going to be a permanent grieving bachelor. John Trumbull, the painter of the American Revolution, takes Jefferson to this agricultural granary that has a dome on it that Jefferson wants to see. And there he meets uh, this extraordinary diminutive British-Italian painter by the name of Maria Cosway. And Jefferson falls in love with her. He, he, he He's just overwhelmed by her sexual energy and her charm and her beauty and her passion and her 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 character her she's she's sort of a frivolous european aristocratic woman but drop dead beautiful and and funny and married and married and so jefferson falls in love with her but he then in a moment of one of their romantic adventures in the greater environs of paris falls and breaks his wrist. Well, I, I read that he either jumped a fountain or a barrel of some or type. Or a fence or something. But as a, as a probably as an, uh, an attempt to... Impress or right, yeah. just show his elation or, I've done this. I mean, this is really stupid. And he falls and breaks his wrist. And it there's it's not like you go to an emergency room today and it's beautifully set and that's the end of that. It was set by a barber. Barbers were the bone surgeons of the time, bone setters, and it's badly set and he never regains use of this right wrist and he can't play the violin anymore and he has to learn to write with his left hand and so on and so forth. But but his his French advisors say, you know what you need to do is go down to the, to the south coast of France to a, a village called Aix-en-Provence, which is a spa town, and they have these mineral waters. And if you go to Aix-en-Provence and, and take the waters, Europeans love their spas, that this will maybe ease the suffering in your wrist and maybe even help to cure you. Jefferson doesn't believe this for a minute, but he sees it as an opportunity to make a grand trip to southern France to see the great wine districts of France and to see the Canal de Midi, the world's first great European canal, and to go to Marseille and see something about American trade that could come to the port of Marseille. And so he justifies this journey, and in it he has maybe the greatest whimsical journey of his life. He goes solo. He goes through the wine districts Did, of France. Not even, didn't even take uh, servants. Or, no, he, he, he hired servants himself. as he right. went, and he took his carriage, but it could be taken apart and put back together. It was really a beautiful journey for Jefferson, and it, it may be the culmination of his private happiness, even though he was alone on this journey. Hmm. 
Well, we, we need to take a break, as you can tell from the exit music. Um, there's a lot more to talk about. I do want to talk about this trip a bit more, if you'll share some. Certainly. And obviously, we need to talk about Maria Causeway. The great Maria Causeway. And uh, I'd also kind of like to get an assessment from you as to what sort of a job he did. Was he successful under the circumstances? Fair enough. So we'll be back in just a moment. You are listening to... The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson or your weekly conversation with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And it is Clay who we are speaking with this week. I'm your host, David Swenson. And we, when we when we stopped for our, our break, Clay, we were talking about, uh, well, about Maria Causeway. And last week I referenced this book several times, Jefferson Abroad. And if you go to the very last letter in it, it's, it's written on October 14th, 1789. It's the last letter that he wrote while in Europe, and it is to Maria Causeway. And I was sitting in my backyard last night and, and going through this book, and my wife was there, and I said, oh, my goodness, you, you must hear this letter. And, and I explained the circumstances and read it to her, and it's, I am here, my dear friend, waiting the arrival of a ship to take my flight from this side of the Atlantic, and as we think last of those we love most, I profit from this latest moment to bid you a short but affectionate adieu. And the letter ends, uh, so be it, my dear friend, and adieu under the hope which springs naturally out of what we wish once again and then farewell, remember me and love me. And uh, Jan said, well, geez, were, were they... Got a room. Were they... In, and I said, well... No, I don't think so. I don't think they consummated she this. She was like, uh, there was a platonic. And she said, doesn't sound platonic to me. I don't think I don't think they ever consummated this. But he was certainly in love with her, and she with him. I, I had I had to read that because I just thought that was, it's a beautiful letter, as most of his letters are. Not surprising that he fell in love with her because she was sort of famous for making men fall in love with her. She was one of those women who can just make men surrender to her beauty and charm. Um, James Boswell, the great British uh, journal keeper, said she treats men like dogs. <laughs> and he had he had been swept into her orbit as as everyone was, and everyone knew this that she was a she had conquests. Um, once she made a man fall in love with her, then she would exact from him what she could: parties and gifts and travels and love and friendship and and so on. And then hold him at arm's length and never sleep with him. And eventually, the man would grow tired of this and disappear. Well, she was married. She was married, but it was a marriage of mere convenience. But the, what's remarkable— How do we David, know that? Well, we do because uh, the way she talks about her husband, what others said about her husband, her husband was a miniature portrait painter, a pornographer, among other things. Miniature portraits. Yeah. I don't even want to say what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, and he um, was kind of a well-known guy. and he, uh, he Chrysler. Well, he, he was the Chrysler of his time, let's put right, it that okay. way. And so he comes to Paris to, to, to paint— paintings of, of aristocratic families. He's busy. Painting is hard daily work. She's available. She she and Jefferson have this romance. Sometimes her husband was along. How long did it last? Uh, it lasted from August of 1786 until October of 1786. That's when she went back to England with her husband. But it didn't end then. She came back alone the next year. And Jefferson can kind of <laughs> 
this is such a horrible story because it puts Jefferson in kind of a bad light. So they've had whatever this is. I don't think it was consummated, but it was certainly intense and erotic and romantic. And she probably provided Jefferson with a sense of being loved after the death of his wife. It was probably very important for his healing. But then she goes back with her husband to England. He writes his famous letter, My Head and My Heart. He says, you must come back. You must come back. You must come back. She comes back alone the next year, and Jefferson kind of freaks out, and he avoids her because he, he knows that if, if they get together alone and there's no Richard nearby, her husband, they probably wind up consummating this, – this thing probably turns into a revolution. So you're saying that Jefferson had a sense of what that would keep him from doing this? Propriety and fear. Propriety because – he didn't really want to sleep with – well, he wanted to, but I mean he didn't really intend to sleep with Maria Cosway. He, want, he wanted the joy. He had a moral sense. Yes, and it was okay to have this eroticized flirtation. This is France in this era, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. But the idea of actually then turning it into a, a bedroom love affair was more than Jefferson was prepared to do. Sure, because be, even the beginning he talked about the the – trouble he had with the morals of the French people, and he, he would have been falling right into what he criticized. And right? in his letters to her, he'd say, well, your husband and, and you and I should go here, and we should do this. And it was all kind of this dance. So then she comes back alone, and Jefferson Sounds like well, she was a piece of work. Yeah, she was, but she later became a nun. <laughs> anyway, so Jefferson, she, the, 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 the surprising part of this whole story is that she fell in love with Jefferson. And Jefferson had been saying to her all along, you should come to Virginia to paint the natural bridge. You should come to Virginia to paint the confluence of the Potomac and the Shenandoah. You should come to America to paint Niagara. And so he gets back to the United States after this episode, after 1789, and she starts to say, okay, I, I will come to America. And he says, well, m madam... Maybe not. And he begins to hold her at arm's length because it's the Las Vegas effect. This made sense in Europe. This would not have been acceptable to the American people had she turned up in America and been escorted by the great Jefferson to Niagara or to the Natural Bridge or anywhere else. This would have been a scandal. It would have meant he would have had to marry her. I mean, the only way that this could have possibly worked out, and still it would have cost him dearly in the political world, is if she had come having divorced her husband, almost impossible in that time, and married Jefferson. And he wasn't prepared to do this. And it turns out when he, he got He would back, never marry again. His no. wife told him not to. And I don't think he was the kind of man who wanted to marry again. So he sobered up. When he got back to the U.S., he sobered up, and then he wasn't really prepared any longer for her to come, even though she was going to. It ends kind of sadly. She, she eventually leaves her husband. Her husband dies. She comes back to see him through his last death. Uh, she winds up forming a convent school in Italy, and she she's a painter and a composer and many, many other things, but she creates a convent school for girls in Italy, and on the wall of her, she creates a mural, and she leaves a, a blank for Monticello, and she wants Jefferson to send her sketches of Monticello so she can paint in the home of the great... American revolutionary Thomas Jefferson on the on the wall in her, in her school. They keep up a on again off again correspondence for the rest of their lives, but for their long periods of silence, and he doesn't return all of her letters. And he's clearly trying to bring this thing down into a more manageable scale. It's it, from from the point of view of romance, it's disappointing. From a woman's point of view, it's it, it's really upsetting that Jefferson could almost beg her to come to America, and then when she was willing to come, uh, firmly put his foot down and said, that's not going to happen. So you set us up perfectly to walk into the Hemings. Um, and just as an overview, uh, Jefferson came the first time in uh, August of 1786. Four. 84, excuse me. With James Hemings, her brother. And Jefferson's daughter. So it was just the three of them, right? That is correct. Then he took a lot of heat from uh, Abigail Adams about not having his younger daughters there, if well, I he, recall. Well, when his, when his daughter Lucy dies back in Virginia, Jefferson is very, very upset, as you might well expect. She dies in January of 1785. He had left – 
his um, second daughter, Maria, and his youngest daughter, Lucy, with their Aunt Epps back in Virginia because they were too young for the for travel. It was unsafe, and they were young. But then when Lucy dies of complications of whooping cough and teething in 1785, Jefferson panics, as, as well he should have, and says, I want Maria here. Abigail thought he should go get her. Uh, no. No? Abigail thought that if she's going to bring Maria, that's fine. But the minute she gets to Europe, he needs to be there waiting at the dock. And Jefferson wasn't. He sent his maitre hotel. And this really upset Abigail Adams. And she writes him a very sharp letter. You know, it's, it's I the, knew there was something there. It's the age of Jane Austen. So she doesn't just say you cad. But she writes Jefferson a sharp letter and says, I would have thought, sir. That after this poor child of nine crosses the Atlantic Ocean in the in the company of strangers uh, to a world she's never, you know, you would have been there to meet her. So she, his daughter was high, how old at this nine. point? And, and along with his daughter came— He had ordered a chaperon, and he had said in his correspondence that that chaperon should be an elderly black slave woman who had had the smallpox. And for reasons that— he, best left to the Epps, they send instead 14-year-old Sally Hemings, who is three-quarters white, who is just a girl herself, as the chaperone of a nine-year-old. And when Abigail Adams met Sally Hemings in London, she kept um, the, the two girls there for a week or more. When she met uh, Sally Hemings, she said, uh-oh. This can't be good. She's too young to, to be the chaperone. She's a child herself. She should go right back to America. She should never have been sent. This was a mistake. She doesn't say it, but she seems to intuit this is going to be a temptation. This is not good. And so Jefferson pays no attention to that. Sally Hemings comes over to Paris, joins her brother, James Hemings. Which would be... A reasonable, sense. reasonable reason. And maybe Sally wanted to go on the journey because she could be with her brother. You know, we don't know. But two things about this, David. One is, it's very important, James Hemings and Sally Hemings learn that under French law, they're free. They cannot be enslaved under French law. And so if they don't want to go back to the U.S., they don't have to. And they actually put this to Jefferson, at least James Hemings, and I think Sally Hemings may have been at the meeting too, but James Hemings says to Jefferson, here's the truth, here's the law, I've checked into this, I know something about this, all I have to do is go to the authorities and they will protect us, what do you want to do about it? And Jefferson then cuts a deal, and he says to James Hemings, if you come back with me, and teach somebody else the art of French cookery, which I have had you learn at great expense here, I'll free you and I'll give you parting money and set up money so you can go wherever you please in America and find your destiny and set up a, be a chef or set up a cooking school or whatever you want to do. But you have to come home with me. You can't stay here. And you have to teach somebody else at Monticello, another slave, how to do the cooking. And then I will manumit you and give you money. And he is now that we know for truth. He is also said to have said to Sally Hemings, and this comes from her son Madison Hemings, much, much later in the 1870s, that he said to her, If you will come back with me, I will free all of your children when they reach maturity. And she had four surviving children, and all four were, in fact, freed. By Jefferson in two mechanisms. Two were allowed to walk away because they were white enough in appearance to pass, so they just walked off the plantation. And two were freed under a complicated provision in his last will and testament. So all four of Sally Hemings' known children were freed by Thomas Jefferson when they became adults. That does not mean he's their father, but that's the deal that he struck with Sally Hemings in Europe. And he kept that deal. And James Hemings was freed. He went to Philadelphia. He actually committed suicide later. Sally Hemings lives at Monticello until the death of the master. Then Jefferson's daughter Martha permits her to go live alone and free, but while still technically a slave, in Charlottesville, where she is accepted by the community. The community has a sense that she may have been Jefferson's mistress, but they accept her as a 
free black woman, essentially, in her last years. That's the story. Do you recall uh, anything more from Abigail Adams' description? Only that she said that she, this can't be a chaperone. She's as fragile and young and inexperienced and naive and, and, and vulnerable as um, Maria is. So we don't know if she thought she was bright or not. Or She doesn't say that. You know, John Adams later said when the Sally Hemings story broke in 182, Adams said, I don't necessarily think this is true. It doesn't sound like Jefferson, but it could be true because of the nature of slavery. And so that's a really good answer. That's a very neutral answer. We don't ultimately know, David, whether the story is true. You know, I think it's true. You're less you're less convinced, but we can't know. Well, you know, I, I, again, uh, just to, not to get off subject, I I, I, just, I I think it's a it's possible it's true. Um, there's it's a long discussion. What I really have trouble with are um, present day historians who have just become uh, just accepted. It's, it's a fact. You yeah. know, it's. You know, I read a. I read something in the Philadelphia uh, paper recently, and uh, just ten reasons to hate Jefferson. Yeah, well, and, let, let me... and it's you know it's it's just this is all a fact, and you know we don't know, we don't know. All the DNA tells us is that one of her four children was fathered by a Jefferson. That's all we know. Could be multiple Jeffersons. But let me add, let me just go into this direction with this. Ultimately, the the challenge that James Hemings put to Jefferson about enslavement is more important than the sexual story, if it's true, Agreed. of Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Secondly, you said we know that's a fact. We know that's a fact. And do, can you just cite? I believe Jefferson himself acknowledges this. The second thing that I want to say about this uh, is that the mystery, let's, so we don't know whether Jefferson and Sally Hemings were lovers. If they were, then the question becomes, when did it start? Was she 14 or 15 or 16 in France, or was it when they got back to the United States? And her son Madison, late in life with this interview he gave to a white abolitionist in Ohio, says she came back pregnant, and that son Tom, the one who's known as Yellow Tom or Dusky Tom, named after his father presumably, uh, died pretty quickly after the return to Virginia. No one has been able to establish that as true. In other words, if Jefferson and Sally Hemings were lovers, and I, and I want to stop talking about it now, Sally Hemings may or may not have been pregnant in France. If she was pregnant in France, it makes the story a little worse than if she became pregnant when she got back to the U.S. Don't you think there would have been corroboration? You just don't know. And you know, we don't know. We don't know anything about this. But the truth is that... Sally Hemings came to France not when Jefferson arrived there, but later she came as the chaperone to Mary or Maria. She was just a child at the time, 14 years old. She comes back to the United States when Jefferson returns in 1789, and the story becomes a political scandal much, much later in 1802. So we've done it. That is it? That's our second program? And, uh, yeah. and I... We've got to do one more, and that's what did Jefferson learn in France? That sounds great to me. So the next one will be about the key letters to Madison and the lessons that Jefferson learned from his five years residency in Europe and especially in France and Paris. And then it's on to Mr. Hamilton, isn't it? And he comes back and when he lands in the United States in late November of 1789, there's a letter waiting for him on shore that says, um, I'm George Washington. I am the new president of the United States and I have named you to be my secretary of state. And by the way, the Senate has confirmed it. Look forward to that one. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853.
This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.